Jake Ludington here at HPE Discover, and I'm here with Paul Muller. And we were having a conversation a little bit ago about technical debt and the idea that there's this continuous need to innovate faster, but one of the things that happens is you go out and you buy some hardware yeah. or you buy some uh, or license some software and you got the usefulness out of it, yeah. but you're not willing to let it go because because you paid for it. Yeah, that's a huge problem. And I, mean, I guess going back to the conversation we had earlier, you know, I guess we've kind of grown up as an industry in, in kind of thing. You know, we're going to acquire an asset, for example, some infrastructure, a rack of servers and storage, and we're going to run this and, and the apps that go with it, right? And we're going to like sweat this thing out for the next three years or five years. Um, and I guess a couple of things. Number one, we don't talk about retiring that stuff. You know, everyone talks about their their project plan for how they're going to buy it and implement it. But most project plans don't go, and when are we going to get rid of this thing? Because let's be honest, right? I mean, think about the like, smartphones. You know, iPhone was invented in 2007. That's like seven plus years old now, right? Actually, almost 10. Right? And it's a legacy technology in some respects, right? Certainly the initial version was. No one ever talks about how do you retire it. They always talk about how do you acquire it. Um, so I think we've got this, this kind of mindset problem where we treat technology in the same way we treat the Hoover Dam. Yeah, we're going to buy it and sweat it for maybe 50, 100 years, when in reality we need to be thinking about it as like, how do we buy it, get the value out of it, and once it's paid for itself, get rid of it. So how do you get somebody comfortable with that idea? I think there's a whole bunch of problems there because you've got developers who tend to be, um, they tend to, you know, I guess there's a huge amount of pressure for them to pick the right platform to build on, and so they're part of the problem because of course what they choose becomes part of that technology stack that you then inherit and have to carry forward. Um, I think we've got to re-educate CFOs because the CFOs tend to kind of come at you and go, well, you know, you're going to buy this stuff. And again, they treat it like the Hoover Dam, thinking, well, I've got to sweat the useful the life of this over multiple years versus thinking about it in, matter, you know, in terms of the, has it paid for itself basically? Uh, or has it proven itself enough such that we can get rid of it and move to the next phase? Uh, and then architecturally, like the op whether it's the operations guys or your architects, this whole get, I guess getting to, used to the notion of refactoring, right? Have we have we made enough progress that we know we've gotten value, but have we hit a roadblock that says maybe we need to re-architect or rethink what we're doing and move to a next generation architecture? Backing out that uh, you know because you, you made a lot of points there, but backing Sorry, out dude. to like the uh, the CFO and. I mean, it seems like, and this is sort of one of those classic C-level discussions of yeah. the CIO needing to go to the CFO and negotiate for, for more budget. And I, I'm wondering if maybe one of the ways to look at that and in the kind of refactoring and, and disposing of things once you've gotten your useful, usefulness out of it is kind of factoring into the budget a recapture of selling off whatever that asset is. Yeah, it's a really good point. In fact, I actually think the whole, um financial modeling of IT projects needs to be rethought. Um, and we're starting to see, I think it's one of the reasons people love cloud, right? Is because you're not carrying forward all of those assets. You can, you can. I'm gonna say goof around. You can goof around and, and try different architectures, different approaches without carrying all of that capital cost with you. So I suppose the answer to the question is, can I use things like financial services, innovative leasing approaches to do the same thing, but do it on premises? That would be my, a simple response to it. And, and I mean, while, while there was a, a big discussion around moving from CapEx to OpEx in the, in the move to the cloud, yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure, uh, I mean, you still look at things like you've got ongoing like licensing support costs, and I mean, a HPE certainly, that's part of the business model of, yeah. the, of, of your, your part of HPE. Of course. And so uh, that seems like a, a key area where if you're financial modeling, uh, you know, looking at how do I say, okay, I've got this software today that's got some support costs associated with yep. it that are kind of the uh, the capital expenditure, if you will, of, yeah. of cloud software. Uh, and then, you know, sunset those and then move on to the next thing. I think the, that, that's, I suppose that's the, that's the gnarly part of the problem, right? Is because as you say, is you, you're not, often you're not making the decision just simply based on, you know, which API should I use, for example? It's which API do I use, which, in, which implicates, which software stack, which implicates which set of support costs, which might be either internal support costs, because don't forget, open source, you have support costs too. They're, oh, just, they're just hidden in a different way, right? Or third-party vendor uh, support costs. 
um, that I need to integrate into this approach. I, I, look, I'd love to say it's a simple solution. I, I guess finding flexibility would be my response to that. It's like work with vendors who are capable of, uh, for example, taking maybe a pre-committed contract and moving it from one product to another product, um, or alternatively looking at ways of being able to terminate with, in, you know, terminate an agreement in such a way that you don't have these long tail um, costs that you need to absorb. It's, it's not necessarily always a technology issue, it's a business and contractual discussion. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely less about the actual development life cycle and it's more about all of the kind of operational underpinnings of software development. Yeah, you've got to be really careful because, again, the developers, if let loose to do their thing, can create a whole bunch of technology debt that you inherit too, don't forget, right? Because if they start cherry picking stuff from all over the place and the, and the developers don't always necessarily think about the, the, the long tail costs, they think about the short term benefits of being able to get that app shipped. Um, I think you can wind up inheriting, look, again, this is part of the problem. It's like you don't necessarily deploy a system for a day. It, it, that the, the, the app, let's just say you're, you know, I'm going to pick Twitter as an example. If you're Twitter uh, and your developer makes a choice, you've got, you potentially need to carry that forward, not just for a month, a year. You could have that for 10 years or you could dispose of it tomorrow. And I guess the challenge is always looking at the implications of, scale and I guess maybe that's what we need to be doing a better job of is scenario planning and saying look what if this is a success and we need to pay for this for the next 10 years at a scale of a billion users what if it's a complete failure and we need to back it out of our architecture or if that vendor that we're using we, we didn't even talk about this goes bank you know goes bust right if they die if that technology becomes and, and a that, dead happens, end. that happens all the time especially now right we're living in this crazy age of innovation where there seems to be more like tech startups than ever that you can like go and adopt but you might adopt them and find they're gone tomorrow. If you need to back that out of your architecture, what is the cost of that as well? So, you know, and I know I'm, I'm trying to make this really simple, but the added complexity would be, or I'm, I guess I'm trying to simplify, but the added complexity would be, you don't want to overthink it as well, because at the end of the day, you just got to ship something. Yeah, it's all about shipping. It's, sh it's about shipping stuff, right? So if you, if you sit there hesitating, going, have I made all the right choices? You know, hesitation is going to kill you too. So, you know, it's 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 kind of never been a better time to be a technology innovator, but it's never been harder as well. And I guess that's why they call it work. Maybe maybe the opportunity is for for somebody like an HPE software to uh, provide a, a different kind of modeling tool that that allows people to forecast. You know, things like what if what if we get a billion users? Yeah, look, it's a great question, and. and we certainly do some of that stuff, right? So we've built um, tools and technologies like service and network virtualization, or um, service virtualization in this case means simulating the behaviors of services and network performance. So you can start to model out, well, you know, if we, start, if we do turn the crank up on this thing, what does that look like? So you can start to get some metrics around that. The other thing that we are doing, uh, you know, not to plug up, you know, HPE, but um, that I think is really important is actually working on financial models. So coming up with innovative financial services solutions so that, for example, you can do a buy and lease back, um, um, which frees up a whole bunch of capital, which makes it a lot more like a traditional SaaS offering or cloud offering without necessarily having to bet your business on a cloud company that may not be around tomorrow. And, and certainly HPE will be around tomorrow. It's a, it's a big company. <laughs> All right, thanks, Paul. Thank you, Jake.